praise Lord. I'm Pastor Michael Jackson. Welcome to the Wednesday night Cutting It Right Bible Study. Once again, coming to you with a word and a Bible study for your heart and for your soul. We come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We are streaming right now live over Facebook and YouTube, Periscope slash Twitter, and of course on Spreaker.com. That is our podcast platform. You can also find all of our podcasts on Spotify, Google Podcasts, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, CastBox, and Podcast Addict. So we bless the Lord and we thank him for what he is doing. You can also go to our website at that's the word.org and do not forget our YouTube channel. That's the word ministries. Go there. You'll find all of our podcasts and videos and sermons. And I believe that you will be blessed by subscribing. And so you take the time, if you will, to go over to our YouTube channel. That's the word ministries. Well, amen. We are nearing the end. We are nearing the end of our uh, study that we began at the first of the year uh, on the Word of God, entitled Sharper, a study on the power and relevance of the Word of God. So far, we've talked about the mighty P's. We've talked about uh, having a, a word's eye view. We've talked about what the Bible says on certain areas. And, and we also talked about the friendly enemies, the enemies of the cross. Uh, we talked about keys to word comprehension. And on last week, we began uh, talking about the perverted Gospels, the perverted Gospels. And on tonight, uh, we're going to finish uh, our study uh, on the perverted Gospels. Now, before we pray, before we get into our study, just want to remind you, and we're very excited, we have written a book. And that book is entitled, The Lights in the Windows. The Lights in the Windows. It's all about evangelism. What is what is the number one thing that Jesus told us just before he left this earth? He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Preach this gospel. And we believe that uh, the church has sort of veered away from its main focus. And this book is all about the church, where it is now, where it needs to be, and what we need to know as we go into this thing we call evangelism. Amen? And so you can find it. You can find it on Amazon.com. And we pray that you'll pick up a copy. I'm sure it will be a blessing. And I'm sure it will speak into your life. Amen? The lights in the windows. Amen? So we bless the name of the Lord. Amen? We're going to pray. And we're going to get right into our study for tonight. We know that the Lord... Uh, has some powerful words uh, for us tonight as we uh, start our study uh, because uh, some of the things that we will say tonight might be deemed uh, a little bit controversial. Uh, some of the things that we might say tonight uh, might be seen as a little uh, upsetting to some. Uh, here, here, let me give a little disclaimer, if I may. Uh, we, we do not exist. We do not uh, carry on this particular ministry to poke holes in other people's beliefs, uh, we do not. Uh, we do not intend to offend. Uh, we do not. Uh, we do not intend to lift ourselves up while we put others down. This is not our intent. This is a Bible study. This whole ministry is dedicated to the truth and the study of the Word of God. And in this particular study, we are talking about the truth and relevance and relevance rather of the Word of God. So. In order to do so, uh, we need to point out where we see truth and where we don't see truth. On tonight's podcast, we're going to, at the end of the podcast, uh, we're going to discuss six powerful contrasts between a perverted gospel and the true gospel. Amen. So stay with us. and We'll get to that at the end of our podcast tonight. But let's start with a word of prayer. Lord, we bless your name. We thank you once again for giving us this opportunity to share your word. Uh, Lord, we pray that you will uh, allow those who need to hear this word to enter in, even right now, to hear this word. Lord, I pray that you will send them to this place on the World Wide Web to hear your word, Lord Jesus. Lord, we don't intend to lift ourselves up. Lord, we just want to lift up the truth of your word. So, Lord, have your way. Bless us together right now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to take you to the book of Galatians. We started there last week. That's going to be our that's going to be our foundation verse here tonight. The book of Galatians chapter number 1. 
Galatians chapter number one, and we're going to start reading in verse number six. Galatians chapter one and verse number six. Don't forget, if you're watching over Facebook, uh, take the time to share this page. If you're watching over Periscope slash Twitter, you can retweet that others also may be blessed on tonight. The epistle of the Galatians, of Paul, the, the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Galatians, chapter number one, verse number six, it says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Verse number nine, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Those are powerful, powerful words. He says, if someone comes to you with something, with a word, with a gospel, which is contrary, which is different than the gospel that he has preached, he said, that person should be pronounced accursed, anathema. Those are powerful, powerful words. Now, let's go over again what we mean by perverted. What is a perverted gospel? A perverted gospel, the word perverted there, it means turn around, turn around. So a perverted gospel, a, a perverted gospel is a gospel uh, which turns the focus away from Christ to something else, some aspect of Christ to something else. So we need to be very careful. We need to be very careful. And there are many. Tonight, we're going to touch on three prominent, three prominent uh, false gospels, three prominent other gospels, as Paul puts it, uh, that will do this, that will stress a particular area and in doing so, take away from the truth of the gospel. We're going to get into that, but let's continue talking about this perverted gospel. Now, here is the threefold problem of a perverted gospel. We talked about this last week, the threefold problem of a perverted gospel. Number one, a perverted gospel is illegitimate. It's not real. It's not real. Number two, it is troublesome. We see here in verse number eight, uh, where, where he says, uh, rather in verse number seven, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you. They trouble you. These gospels that individuals present as truth are troublesome. And so we need to be very, very mindful of that. Third problem of a uh, false gospel, of a perverted gospel, is that they are all distortions. They are all distortions of the truth. And when you have a distorted gospel, you have a deceptive gospel. If it's distorted, it's going to deceive someone. And on next week's podcast, we're going to we're going to bring up the subject. We're going to bring up the subject of biblically the problem and the plague of biblical illiteracy. The problem and plague of biblical illiteracy. And that is why false gospels are rampant. That's why false gospels strive. That's why false gospels are so prevalent in the church today. And so we need to make sure that we understand that these perverted gospels are illegitimate, they are troublesome, and they are distortions to God's truth. And we need to make sure that we know the difference. The only way, listen, the only way you're going to know the difference between a perverted gospel and the true gospel is through the power of discernment. Every child of God has the power of discernment. Now, your discerning capabilities will be based upon the measure and the amount of time you spend in the Word of God. 
If you don't read the word, if you don't study the word, then your, your discerning capabilities, your ability to discern truth from error will be greatly lowered. You need to know the word. You see, because what happens when you hear a word that is not true, when you hear a false gospel, when you hear error, when you hear a perverted gospel, bells and whistles should go off in your spirit. Bells and whistles should go off in your spirit and that you know that something is amiss. Something has gone awry. Something in the spirit where uh, doctrines of devils are trying to consume me and trying to take me in. And that's what they will do. Doctrines of demons. There's a reason why false teaching and error and perverted gospels are called doctrines of demons. Because that's where they come from. They come from the pit. The enemy knows what this word is. The enemy knows the truth. Not that he will abide in the truth, of course not. But he knows the truth and he will do all he can to pervert it. He will do all he can to twist it. A twisted and perverted gospel will be sometimes so close to the truth that it will pull you in. It will pull you in. And what some individuals will do, uh, they will speak the truth only to begin to unravel the truth as they continue to speak. It sounds right. It is right. This is good. And all of a sudden, somewhere in the narrative, it begins to turn. And that's when your spirit should realize that something is wrong. Something is wrong. So we need to know that they are illegitimate, troublesome, and they are distortions. They are meant to deceive. Amen? Now, we want to take a look at some of the perverted Gospels. What, it, what are some of the prominent perverted Gospels? And now, listen, we are not going to, uh, we are not going to go in depth with these things. Uh, you can go back into our archives. Uh, we have spoken about these particular uh, false Gospels, these other Gospels. We have spoken about these at length. In our studies of the past, you can go into our archive, you can go to Spreaker.com, and you can uh, go to the Cutting It Right Bible Study page and scroll down, and you will find uh, you will find all of our teachings on these doctrines, okay? You, you will find them. But suffice it for tonight, uh, we're just going to pull out certain points about some of these other Gospels, uh, and show how they are not the truth, though they may sound like the truth. And I know that there are going to be some that will hear some of these things. And once again, you, you, you may not be in agreement, but we are going to speak the truth as the Lord gives it to us. Amen. Number one, uh, we have what is known as the gospel of grace. The gospel of grace is also known as the grace revolution. This gospel of grace, also known as the grace revolution, uh, is also in some circles called hyper grace. Hyper grace. In other words, there's an overemphasis. Yes, there can be an overemphasis of grace. Uh, and we will tell you how this happens. Number one, the gospel of grace, and, and I'm not tonight, I'm not going to name names. That's not my intention tonight. Uh, but these individuals that bring out these Gospels are prominent. They are prominent in Christian media. They are on television. They are on the internet. They are prominent. They are large ministries. And that's how these, that's how these false truths are promoted because these individuals have large ministries and people follow them in droves. But here's one point of the gospel of grace. The gospel of grace teaches that Christians should not, I repeat, that Christians should not confess their sins anymore. Now, if you are not part of the gospel of grace, that thought sounds pretty bad. I am not a part of the gospel of grace movement, so to me, that sounds very bad. The fact that Christians are not 
to confess their sins. It is the belief in the gospel of grace that if Christians continue to confess their sins, they will they will get a sin consciousness. And because we are the righteousness of God, somehow, somehow our sins are already, all of our sins, past, present, and future, are already forgiven. Now, once again, we said that we have to be very careful. This statement is true. That statement is true. All of our sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven. How are they forgiven, though? Okay, here's how they are forgiven. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, his blood made provision for our sins that when we come to him and ask us, ask him to forgive, that they would be forgiven. But we still need to bring our sins to the cross. Now, the grace movement, this grace revolution, they do not state that we are sinless. They do not specifically state that, but to ignore. And they also say, here's the second point, that the Holy Spirit does not, I repeat, that the Holy Spirit does not convict Christians of sin. Rather, he convicts them of righteousness. Now, I don't quite understand that statement, but once again, this statement, this statement is very close to blasphemy. Now, understand what the word blasphemy means. The word blasphemy means simply to say, uh, to speak bad about, to say bad words about, and to conclude that the Holy Ghost, one of his ministries, to conclude that one of the ministries of the Holy Ghost does not exist, that it is not true, is borderline blasphemy. You are calling out the Holy Spirit and says something that he does. No, you don't. That's not what you do. So that is a very, very serious error. Serious error. Yes, the Holy Ghost does convict of sin. He convicts the world of sin. As John says in verse, in chapter number uh, 14 of John, uh, of chapter 16 of John. And yes, he does convict Christians of sin, ladies and gentlemen, if you sin, the Holy Ghost will convict you. And conviction is just being made aware of your sin. Now, Satan will condemn. There's no doubt about it. Satan will condemn us, but the Holy Ghost will convict us, make us aware of our sin, and lead us to do what is right, which is to confess which is to repent. That's what the Holy Spirit will do. He will not poke and poke and poke and say, look how bad you are, and you're a terrible person because of all that you have done and all that you're doing. That's not what the Holy Ghost does. At the same time, we must not come away with the idea uh, that the Holy Ghost sort of uh, allows us to be who we are, allows us to sin. The Holy Ghost does not give us a license to sin. Nowhere in scripture do we speak of the Holy Ghost giving us license to sin. Here's what the Bible does say, though. The Bible says where sin does abound, Romans chapter 5 and verse number 20, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. So this is talking about the fact that sin does exist in the life of a Christian. All you need to do is read uh, chapter 7 of Romans. Chapter 7 of Romans is Paul speaking about his own experience with sin after he became born again. He was trying to deal with sin in his life in the wrong way. He was trying to deal with sin according to the law, which he had come out of, which he knew very well. And he was trying to still live his Christian life by following and keeping the law. And it did not work until he comes to that point in chapter seven, where he says, oh, wretched man that I am trying to keep trying to live the Christian life. And we'll get on this in a little bit as we move on, but trying to keep the Christian life by keeping the law. You will find that it will leave you in 
misery. Leave you in ministry. Now, let's look to thir- at the third point of the grace revolution. And once again, we're not, uh, we are not trying to give a full view, but we are giving a short overview, just pointing out some things about several uh, other gospels, which are not other gospels at all, but pointing out where they move away from the truth. Third thing about the gospel of grace is that they believe, they believe that 1 John chapter number 1 and verse number 9 is not written to Christians. You see, if it was written for Christians, it does, it does totally contradict what they believe, that Christians should not confess their sins. Rather, what the what the grace movement says about 1 John 1 9 is that they were ri- it was written to Gnostics. It was written to a group of individuals who were prominent in that day called Gnostics. They were into knowledge. Knowledge was very great for the Gnostics. But this is not true. Because throughout throughout the book of uh, 1 John, John uses the word, my little children, brothers, sisters. It is obvious that he is speaking to Christians. Here in verse number uh Chapter number two and verse number one, he says, my little children. Scripture never refers to those who do not know the Lord as little children, my little children. But here's what the Bible says in first John and one verse, chapter one and verse number nine. If we confess, who's the we? We say that the we are Christians, born again ones. If we confess our sins, the Bible says here, that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. And so if we confess our sins, if we as Christians confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. That's what scripture says. I can go back into the Old Testament. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse number 14. Yes, he was speaking to the children of Israel, but once again, that application can find it, uh, the application of those verses can also find a place in our own hearts. The Bible says in Second Corinthians, Second Chronicles chapter 7, and verse number 14, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and here it comes, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Notice the phrase, turn from their wicked ways. His people, can God's people, do God's people have wicked ways? The answer is absolutely, absolutely. We are flawed. You see, ladies and gentlemen, as children of God, as God's people, as the chosen generation, as the royal priesthood, as the holy nation, as his peculiar people that should choke off the praises of him, we still have a sin nature. It is in us. And it does what it can to bring sin out. The sin nature in us is like a factory. It's like a sin factory. And its desire is just to push sin out. That's what it does. That's what it does. But thank God, through Christ and the cross, we have victory. Having victory over sin, uh, not allowing sin to have dominion over us, does not mean sinless perfection. In no way, shape, or form. So once again, 1 John 1, 9 is talking to Christians. You and I sin, and when we sin, we need to bring our sin to the cross immediately. And we are guaranteed that when we do so, he will forgive us. That's what it means when the Bible, when, when individuals say all of our sins, past, present, and future are forgiven. Two weeks from now, if I sin, when I sin, two weeks from now, I am guaranteed that when I go to him and ask him to forgive me, he will forgive me. Future sins. 
he will forgive. But that does not mean that the fact that past, present, and future sins are forgiven, oh, they're all forgiven already. I don't need to express them to him. I don't need to confess. No. Don't believe that lie. Confess your sins to the Lord. Amen. Now let's move on. Let's move on to our second, uh, our second perverted gospel. Perverted gospel. And this is, this is also another prominent, uh, a prominent uh, gospel. Once again, I'm putting gospel in, in quotations and because they are not really true gospels. Uh, it's the kingdom now or also called dominion theology. Kingdom now and dominion theology. Theology, very, very prominent. Once again, large ministries uh, subscribe to this particular uh, point of view. And let's take a short look at it. Kingdom now, dominion now. Let, let's, they believe, first of all, they believe that we as the church must prepare the world for the coming of Christ. We must prepare the world for the coming of Christ. Now, we do not read this anywhere in Scripture that we are to prepare the world for the coming of Christ. Now, how does the dominion, how do the dominionists determine to do this? They believe that they are to put Christians in every strata of society. There should be Christian doctors. There should be Christian lawyers. There should be Christians in every strata of society. Now, there is nothing wrong with that thought. We want individuals to be saved. Whatever they do for a living, whatever their occupation, we want people to be saved. This is what we want. Now, that brings us to another point. The Dominionists believe that the idea of dominion comes from the Bible. It comes from Genesis chapter number one. Let's read Genesis chapter number one. Genesis chapter number one. And verse number, let's look at verse number eight. There are other places that we could go, but let's go here first. All right, not one eight. That is that is one twenty eight. I'm sorry. Here's what it says: And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. No problem there. And replenish the earth and subdue it, and have here it comes and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over Every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Every living thing that moveth or also means that creepeth upon the earth. Have dominion over it or them. Now, the question becomes, who is the Lord speaking about? Who are these individuals that man is supposed to have dominion over? Who are these subjects? Let me put it that way. Who are the subjects? It says, number one, have dominion over the fish. Have dominion over the fowl, that's the, the birds. Have dominion over every living thing that creeps upon the earth. Ladies and gentlemen, human beings do not creep upon the earth. Insects creep. Animals with four legs or whatever how many legs an animal may have, they creep. But people do not creep. No. So, this so-called command to have dominion over the earth, they're already starting on a faulty foundation. And that skewers and twists everything else they say. Okay? So, scripture is clear. That no, we are not to have dominion over the world. And it sort of gives us, and here's another point of the dominionists. They believe that we are sort of supposed to take over the world for Jesus. No, not in a violent way. No, no, no. But 
take over the world for Jesus. Now, this sounds correct. I will admit that sounds correct. Let's, let's take the world for Jesus. Let's get out there. I believe, listen, I believe in evangelism. I be, but this is, this is more than evangelism, what they're talking about. Okay? Here is the simple truth that Jesus said. The simple truth that Jesus said, and let's, let's, let's go to this simple truth that Jesus said, and he said it in the book of Matthew. He said it in Matthew chapter number 28 and verse number 19. Here's what Jesus said. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Let's go to the book of Mark. Jesus also spoke these same words and Mark uh, wrote this. Mark chapter 16 and verse number 15. Mark 16 and verse number 15. It says, and he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Creature means Creation. Obviously, creature is not talking about creatures because animals, which are creatures, don't have the understanding. So he's talking about people. We ought to preach the gospel to people. We ought to preach the gospel to those who are unsaved. Because the gospel is the power of God that leads to salvation. That's what we are to do. Nowhere does Jesus intimate on any level that we are supposed to take over the world for Christ? That is an improper way to put it. We are simply to tell the world, go and preach, proclaim the gospel. Tell the truth. Tell, tell the world who Jesus is. Tell Jesus what he, tell the people what he came to do. And tell the people what Jesus wants to do. That's what we are to do. Go into all the world and preach this gospel. And so you see the error and the perverseness. And once again, when we say perverse, we're not talking about perverse in, this, in the way that we understand the word perverse and perverted. The Bible definition for that word perverted, once again, is to turn around. It means to turn it around, to say something different than what it actually is. All right. So kingdom now, having said that they uh, want to prepare the world for Jesus, they come to the conclusion that there is no rapture. You see, the rapture states that Jesus is going to come unexpectedly. He's going to come unexpectedly. Okay. That's the idea behind the rapture. He's going to come for his church. The Bible says that we who are uh, uh, that we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. This is the rapture. He will he will snatch us out of this world. When this will happen, no one knows. No one knows. But what I say, I say what John said. In Revelation, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We don't know when that is. No man knows the day or the hour. No one. So this is what we are to do. But the rapture is true. But the rapture conflicts with what the dominionists believe. If Jesus is going to come unexpectedly and take us away, what if the church is not ready? Listen, the Bible says he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. We understand that the church has problems. We understand that the church is rife with false teaching. But listen, there is a remnant. There is a remnant. There is a remnant. God's people are standing strong. The church is not going away. The church is not going to get stamped out. The devil is not going to infiltrate and take over the church. It's not going to happen. And when Jesus is ready to come back, he is going to come back for a church without spot 
or a wrinkle. Remember who the church is. The church is the people. Know ye not that ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost. That is the church. That is the church. And so we want to make sure that that's where we are. Making sure that we are following the truth. Be very careful. Be very careful. Now, let's look at this third this third uh, false gospel, false teaching that is prominent in the church, has been prominent, is becoming more prominent, uh, and that is the Hebraic Roots Movement. Hebraic Roots, which simply, uh, which simply uh, believes uh, that Jesus' death on the cross did not, I repeat, Jesus' death on the cross did not end uh, the Mosaic Covenant or the Covenant of the Law. Jesus' death on the cross did not end it. Rather, it renews it. It expands it. No, this is not what Scripture says. You see, uh, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, if the Old Covenant was, what was, I'm going to paraphrase a bit here. If the Old Covenant was okay the way it was, that there would have been no need for a new covenant. We have a better covenant now. Jesus Christ is the new covenant. And when Jesus came, he blotted out. Let's go to let's let's go to the book of Colossians. He blotted out the handwriting that was against us. Let's go to the book of Colossians, chapter number 2. And we read this. Colossians chapter number 2 and verse, let's start in verse uh, number 13. Let's start in verse number 13. Colossians chapter 2 verse 13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you of you all, all your trespasses. 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. That is the law the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. He says here that the law was against us. Why, how was the law against us? Because there was no way that we could keep it. The whole purpose of the law was to show us our inability to keep it. There was nothing in the law to make us righteous. Keeping the law does not make an individual righteous. Now, having said all of that, there is no flaw in the law. <clears throat> there is no flaw in the law. The law did what it was supposed to do. Show you your need of Christ. The Bible says the law was a schoolmaster to point us to Christ, who is the better way. But just keeping the law is not good enough. Because keeping of the law does not make you righteous. Let's go to the book of Galatians, chapter number 2, verse number 20. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, Paul says, I live, yet not I, he says, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God or in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now here 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Why did Christ have to come and die on a cruel cross if I could just be righteous, be saved by keeping the law? What did Jesus come for? Did he make a mistake? No. Because just keeping the law was not good enough. All of the Old Testament, all of the Old Testament uh, feasts, talking about Passover and, and all the Old Testament feasts, they were temporary stopgap measures. Here's what, here's what all... The, the, the lamb and the goat and the different offerings that people had to bring, 
it was only a stopgap measure that the Lord allowed and accepted before Christ came. When Christ came, all of that was abolished when Christ came. But now you have in the Hebraic, uh, in the Hebraic roots uh, movement, uh, you have individuals uh, performing the and, and keeping the Old Testament feasts. You have Christians. Uh, the Jewish Passover is coming up. And you have entire churches that will be not just observing Passover by pointing out uh, what it meant because all of the Old Testament feasts had a significance. They were looking forward to what was going to happen. But when Christ came, when Christ came, once again, he abolished the law, but the Hebraic Roots Movement says that these things are things that we still need to do. Now that Christ has come, we have a greater understanding and we are still to keep the Old Testament feast. And this is error at its highest degree. Because when we do this, remember I said at the beginning, talking about the Hebraic Roots Movement, that they believe that Jesus Christ's death on the cross did not abolish the law. But it did. You see, that's that's the that's the subtle error that Satan brings. He says it's good. He says it's good that you are doing these things. It's good that you're keeping the Passover. It's good that you're keeping these laws because they are uh, they are the feast of the Lord. They're the Lord's feast, and you should keep the Lord's feast. No, no, no. When Jesus Christ came, that ended the law. And to do otherwise, to do otherwise is, book of Hebrews, I believe it's chapter number 10, uh, talks about uh, it is it is literally, it, it, it offends the Holy Spirit. It offends the blood of Christ when we continue to observe the law. Here's what it says in Galatians chapter number 5. Galatians chapter number 5 and verse number 1. It says, stand fast or stand firm, therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. You're free from what? Free from the law. Stand firm in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. That's the law. That bondage he's talking about is the law. Even in, even in Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 11, it is a common verse that we use uh, when we're talking uh, to individuals about Christ and coming to the law and coming to the Lord. But in Matthew chapter 11, uh, Verse number 28, Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What was he talking about? Yes, it's drawing people to come to Christ, but he was speaking to Jews who were under the burden and bondage of trying to keep the law to be righteous. And they could not do it. They could not do it. So he says, Come unto me all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest from you trying to keep the law in your own strength and power. I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you. Not the yoke of the law. Take my yoke upon you. Grace, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. You see, law is a taskmaster. A taskmaster, rather. The law says you've not done enough yet. Nope, you still have to do more. Nope, you still have to do more. When do you know that you've done enough when it comes to trying to keep the law? You see, in those days, uh, the Pharisees had added what we call fence laws. Laws upon laws upon laws upon laws. They added a law to keep us from, to stop us from keeping the law. And then added another law to keep us from keeping the law to keep. And it went on and went on. And this is not how it was supposed to be. And they began to treat those traditions of men as if they were actual law. And it was not. So these three, 
the gospel of grace, telling people that they don't need to confess their sins, the kingdom now movement, uh, saying that we are supposed to take over the world for Jesus. That is wrong terminology. And number three, the Hebraic roots movement, which says that the cross of Jesus Christ was not enough and that it did not abolish the law, the old Mosaic law. These are all errors and they are perverse gospels. They are perverted gospels. And we need to come out from among them and be separate. We need to come to the truth. We need to come to the truth. Now, as promised, as we close out tonight, I want to talk about uh, six powerful contrasts between a perverted gospel and a true gospel. We talked about three. We just touched on three perverted gospels. There are there are others. But for time's sake, we just touched on the more prominent ones. Number one, a, a perverted gospel is powerless to save. Powerless to save. You see, this, this is why, this is because error does not have the power to change a life. Error, if it's wrong, it won't work. That's as simple as we can put it. If it's wrong, it won't work. So a perverted gospel is powerless to save. But the true gospel is the saving power of God. And that's Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's what the true gospel is. It is the power of God that leads to, that brings salvation. It carries it. Amen. Second thing, the perverted gospel appeals to, to fleshly desires. It appeals to fleshly desires. That's what a perverted gospel will do. The true gospel, a true gospel says that man is in bondage to sin. You see, that's one of the things that the neo gospel, the new gospel, some of these newer gospels, and once again, I use that word gospel not meaning a real gospel. Scripture says they are other gospels, but not another at all. They do not even want to mention sin in their churches, some of them. They do not want to speak or sing about the blood of Jesus in some of these churches. And this is error. The only reason that a person is saved is through the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, some of these churches that have taken uh, the blood and the cross out of their own existence, these places, I do not call them churches anymore. No, they are not churches anymore. They are conscious clearing centers. They are places where people go to feel better, to feel good that they have gone to church and they leave out and they continue with their lives, with their own lives. Third thing, a perverted gospel is tolerant of error and sin. We talked about the grace movement that says you don't need to confess your sins. Then what do you do with the sin in your life that continues to pile up? The grace movement says ignore it. Ignore it. You are the righteousness of God. I tell you the more, if you believe that, yes, we, scripture says we are the righteousness of God. We are. We carry his righteousness, his righteousness, not our own. But if we take this argument to its full length, the sin in our life will take us away. No, no, I'm going to ignore it. No, I feel bad. You have truly born again people full of the Holy Ghost that are walking around ignoring the sin in their lives because they're trying to stay true to this false teaching not to confess their sins. And I've heard, I've heard uh, testimonies of individuals who have come out from under uh, this type of bondage and have said that they were living lives of misery because they were told not to confess their sins, but they were being convicted of their sins. I've heard the testimonies. When you sin, ladies and gentlemen, I repeat, confess, repent. When you sin, not if you sin, when you sin. 
All right. And the true gospel, it humbles us. It humbles us. God resists the proud. Remember, Scripture says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Fourth thing. We're talking about six powerful contrasts between a perverted gospel and the true gospel. The perverted gospel offers a better life. You've heard, you've heard the different words. You've heard the different sayings. Your best life now. You've heard of all of these things. Uh, but the true gospel uh, gives assurance of eternal life. Now, let me tell you something that is going to turn your ear upside down. Jesus Christ did not come to give you a better life. Yeah, I said that. Jesus Christ did not come to give you a better life. What Jesus Christ came to do was to give you new life. He came to make you into a new creation. He wants your old, he wants the old things to pass away. And when that happens, all things become new. The Bible doesn't say he makes he wants to make you better. See, people, people want to just get uh, a better life, but many times they want to leave Jesus out. Just, just make me feel good. Just make me feel good about my life. Make me feel good about myself. My self-esteem is low. The Bible doesn't even speak about self-esteem. I'm not saying that it's not uh that it's a I'm not saying that it's a bad thing not to feel good about yourself, but here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that our sins have taken us away from the Lord. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, and verse number 2, it's our iniquities that have separated us from God that he will not hear us. You see, so we need to, the Bible says in Jeremiah, chapter 17, and verse number 9, that our hearts are deceitfully deceitful and wicked. Above all things, who can know it? That's who we are. We are wicked. Our hearts are wicked. And the only way that we can find our way back is to give our hearts to Jesus. Give our hearts to Jesus. Next, the perverted gospel produces a false hope. A false hope. They make promises that they cannot keep. The true gospel, the true gospel is impossible to believe without conviction. And that brings us to number six. The perverted gospel is easy to believe without repentance. But the true gospel happens when there, there must be conviction. Conviction. Once again, we said that conviction is the Holy Ghost making you aware of your sin and bringing you to a point of making a decision. I want to change. I want to turn around. I want to confess. I want to say the same thing that he says about my sin. That's confession. I want to repent. That means I want to make an about face concerning my sin. Turn away from sin and turn toward God. That is repentance. That is biblical repentance. And so, the perverted gospels, ladies and gentlemen, they are prevalent. They are, they are, they are prominent. They are here. They are here. But we must not allow them to permeate our own lives. We must stand up and speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. Amen. So, Lord, we bless your name tonight. Uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power that we find in your gospel. Lord, we pray that you will keep us true to your gospel, the true gospel, Lord Jesus. Lord, that true gospel lifts you up and not ourselves. It doesn't lift up a man, doesn't lift up a woman, doesn't lift up a church. It lifts you up and you alone. So, Lord, we put our hope and our trust in you. If you're listening and watching tonight, you don't know the Lord for yourself. You're not a Christian. The Lord wants to save you. He wants to save you tonight. Maybe you've heard something about sin tonight and you'd like to make that decision to follow the Lord. Pray this prayer. It's a simple prayer. And it's not so much about the prayer, but where's your faith? Put your faith in what Jesus Christ has done and he will give you his salvation. Repeat after me if you don't know the Lord. Dear Lord Jesus, 
Forgive me of my sins. I realize now that I am a sinner. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to come into my life. I want to live for you. Lord, I thank you for what you did for me on the cross. Lord, help me to live for you all the days of my life. Thank you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. We bless the name of the Lord. We thank him once again for giving us this opportunity to uh, bless his name. And we thank him for what he is doing in our midst. This is That's the Word Ministries, and this is the Cutting It Right Bible Study. We come to you every week at this time with a Bible study for your soul. We have been discussing a sharper, uh, rather sharper, a study on the power and relevance of the Word of God. God. You can find all of our podcasts on Spotify, Google Podcasts, iTunes, iHeartRadio, uh, Apple Podcasts, CastBox, and Podcast Addict. We always stream live over Facebook and YouTube, uh, Periscope slash Twitter, and Spreaker.com. You can go to our website at that's the word.org, and you can go to our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel, which is That's the Word Ministries, and you subscribe there, and I'm sure you will find something uh, that will lift you up, something that will encourage you and empower you. Amen? So we bless the name of the Lord, and we thank him uh, for what he is doing. Remember, do not forget to pick up a copy of our book. You can find it on Amazon.com, The Lights in the Windows. It's all about evangelism, evangelism, where the church needs to be in these last days. We need to be evangelizing. And there are different ways to evangelize, ladies and gentlemen. Evangel evangelism does not just happen behind the pulpit. It does not just happen when you pass out a track. We need to tell the world. We need to get the message out that Jesus loves and that Jesus is coming back again. Amen. Once again, you can pick it up on Amazon.com. Now, tomorrow night, tomorrow night, I'll be over at the Bible Study Club at 8 o'clock with Clarence and Anna Hayes. I'll be uh, sitting in for uh, Clarence Haynes tomorrow night, and uh, we are going to continue in our study, his study of David, of the life of David, and we're going to move ahead in the narrative just a little bit, but we're going to be talking about keys from the cave, keys from the cave, finding light in the dark times. I'm sure that you tune in tomorrow night, and you will be blessed. You go over to the Bible Study Club Facebook page uh, or the Bible Study Club uh, website, ClarenceHaynesJr.com, uh, and you'll get more information on that. Clarence Haynes has also uh, written a book uh, that is available on Amazon. It's called The Pursuit of Purpose. The Pursuit of Purpose, and it's all about how to discover God's will for your life. Once again, it's a good read. It's an excellent read, and I... Uh, Pray that you will also take time to make this book a part of your reading agenda. Amen? Well, we bless the name of the Lord. My name is Pastor Michael Jakes, and once again, this is the Cutting It Right Bible Study. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching. Thank you over on Spreaker.com for listening. We hear you. We see you. We thank you for all of your support. They do listen in from across the United States and around the world. We thank the Lord for them. Amen? Well, this is me, that's you. Don't forget to tune in next week in our study as we begin to bring our study of the Word of God to a close as we uh, discuss the plague and problem of biblical illiteracy. That's next week on the study. Have a good night. May God bless you. <laughs>